The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today what we're going to be doing is uh, last week you gave us uh, some feedback, what you wanted to do in the class. We're going to go through that and talk about the readings. I'm going to do a little uh, calling on you and helping uh, you take the class through the readings. And then the six or seven things I'm going to do, uh, history of money, ledgers, fiat currency, central banks, and credit cards, the role of money, some early uh, digital money. Uh, you had the Clark reading as to a bunch of failed attempts. <laughs> just all the way through a little bit of mobile money, all the way up to Starbucks and, and Alipay. And yet the riddle remains. We're going to get really deep into Bitcoin in the next three classes. But this is to give some foundational uh, uh, bits of money and ledgers and central banking and technology. And then, of course, I always like to finish the class talking a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing between now and then. Even though the readings are required, I know you're all busy. I know that you've all got a bunch of classes and uh, like good business students and business people, you optimize. So I'm trying to give you a sense of why you might read it rather than it's required at the end of each class and how it fits into the, the, the course narrative. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of conclusions. So the survey results, what did you want to learn? This is really your class and uh, I'm going to learn as much from you but hopefully we're going to cover what you want. So here's a list of those things that were at least written by two of you. First was technical things. 18 of you said understanding blockchain technology. Hopefully we get to that, uh, but you might find that you'll want to do more after this class. Uh, the ecosystem and being able to uh, have an educated discussion, sort of the dinner party conversation around blockchain. I, I think we'll be successful, but at the end of the semester, we're going to pull these slides up again, and we'll see how we did as a group. Um, you all talked a lot about applications. Uh, how can you actually apply it? Uh, uh, learning it in the venture space and thinking about uh, where it really works uh, in the world. And I think we're going to spend a lot of time on that in the second half. But all throughout, we're going to be talking about the economics and what's the reality versus uh, the hype. Uh, you also uh, wanted to understand its impact uh, on people's lives, uh, the regulation. Uh, about six of you said something about regulation. Uh, I'm glad because we're only doing one lecture on that. <laughs> but we're going to spread it out because, uh, as we talked about in our first class, and I'm honored Larry's here again, but you know, we're going to always be thinking about Larry's four ways. And, and I see, uh, is it Jihi? What are, what are Larry Lessig's? Uh, you, you shook your head yes. So. Um, I know, um, let's see. It is code and architecture, market, law, and norms. You got it. Does anybody want to say how that relates to blockchain, why we're chatting about that? Oh my god, I'm going to have to cold call fast, right? Oh, you're from R3. Joe. Joe. <coughs> Joe Hill, yeah. Uh, no, I, I remember we saw it last class, but uh, I can relate it now to blockchain. <laughs> can you relate it to anything in light? <laughs> Maybe not. Alon, uh, help your, your table mate out. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for my moment to shine. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't it. This isn't it. <laughs> I'm having fun, you know. This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have fun. It's, don't worry about it. <laughs> so why do markets, code, law, did, did I hear, did I, I can't see your name, but is it the Dort? Yeah, why? Why does that relate to all this? Can you repeat the question? Uh, gee, he, you're going to repeat the question because you, you went through it. So how does uh, Larry... Larry's four forces relate to our converse, our topic of blockchain. And the four forces again are markets, so business, law, code or architecture, call it technology, and social norms. 
from so I think it's because it brings like a new way of doing those things, like a new tool in order to so what I got from the reels is like these that ledgers already existed, but given that now we have like big data, for example, and right. like more things going on helps our society go like that better. Good way to say it. Look, it's, it's, it's unfair of me. It wasn't one of the readings. I'm just saying in everything in life, I find these things grind up against each other. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Washington in politics, but the markets and how the commercial enterprise and the, the economy grinds up against technology and sort of grinds up against the law, and then, of course, just social normative behavior, these four forces, in almost everything one does in life, you will find. Um, and so I, I just ask you to always, whether it's one reading or another reading, bring that to your thought process of this class. I'm not going to assign Larry's uh, assignment. I didn't know he was even going to be here. But I've always thought these is, it's a good discipline to think, OK, what are the commercial realities, the markets? What's the technology? Um, even if it's in an earlier day and it's a technology of the car replacing the horse and carriage, um, how, how, how does government or the official sector put it into a set of standards that are required? And then how do we as society, even if it's not required, just have our behaviors? Those, those are the four forces. So that's why. Uh, and I probably just failed Larry's class, but that's how I've thought about it. <laughs> Uh, I did, probably, right? You know, he's, he's shaking his head. Um, but regulation is just one of those four forces, and that's why I paused there. And so we'll have it in every class, but only one lecture. Uh, money and markets, that's a, one of the other forces. Five of you said you want to make money, and I applaud those who said that because own it. You're in a business school, why not? Um, uh, but investing and trends. Now, there was a bunch of other miscellaneous topics. I'm not going to go through them. I, I kind of thought the last two were interesting, anecdotes from my past. I'm not sure who said that. <laughs> I'm not sure what you want to know about, my three daughters, my running, or this you know, Wall Street stuff and finance. And I'd like to understand hyper-Bitcoinization as well, but I don't know who asked that question. I don't know what it is, so I'll try to figure out what hyper. Does anyone want to own up to that question? They were anonymous. All right. All right. So today's uh, study questions. Uh, what's the role of money historically and in today's digital economy? Um, and, and this is when I'm going to look for discussion. So does anybody want to tell me what the role of money, what, what would be your answer to this? Anton? Um, the, the medium of the transaction and the, um, the, the unit of a, the like, accounting unit, um, and also uh, like the state of the value. All right, so the three, the three classic roles of money that people talk about. Uh, Kelly, you want to repeat what he just said? Yeah, that was sort of part of the question, but I think historically it was paying off debts, starting, you know, and conquering various lands to wars, and then also funding trade wars, collecting taxes. So a lot of uh, societal things that drove civilization forward. Right. right. And what, what we'll discuss today and what it is is that money is a social construct. It's something that societies came together, whether it's hard to tell whether it was 5,000 years ago or eight or 10,000 years ago, uh, that it's really it's a social uh, consensus mechanism. Um, but we're, we're going to chat about the readings in a minute and come back to that question. Uh, what is fiat currency? Does anybody want to? Tom, you want to tell us what fiat currency is? Um, it's a shame, Tom. See, I recognize you. So it's a website. <laughs> um, um, so this is like a established currency by a central government, by a government that's imposed on a market or what you like. All right, so you said it's a central currency. And it's by a government. Anybody else want to add some things? Uh, is it Kyle? Yeah. <coughs> I would just add that it's not backed by any physical commodity. Like so it's not backed, backed by any physical commodity. Yeah, it's really just a good faith and credit of the nation that uh, issues it. Right. Daniel, did you want to add anything? I was just going to say similar that it's not gold backed or anything like that. 
But was it always that way? It wasn't that way. Right, right. Fiat currency might be backed by something of physical. Was there other? Uh, remind me your name, I'm sorry. Josh. Josh. Uh, I think specifically it can be used to settle debts, um, and specifically those to the government, so taxes. All right, so it can be used for taxes. And remind me your name because I can't see a card. What? Sean. Sean. So basically, there's no inherent value in fiat currency. So, so basically, has, if there's no one recognized that that specific currency itself, there's no value. So here's a question for the class. Is there inherent value to non-fiat currency? Because Sean's saying there may be a distinguishing characteristic of fiat is it has no inherent value. Uh, well, actually, the same applies to any commodity that's used to as as, as to back uh, fiat, uh, currency in general, because it's just the scarcity of some specific resource and uh, social uh, common agreement that that's going to be the the the. So, the so, so how many people are more in line with Eric or? There's not one right answer to this. This is, this is a question that's been debated for decades or centuries, uh, but how many are more in Sean's camp? Do they have? Well, I think it depends. Like, for example, gold is definitely like a social construct. We decide that as a human society that gold is going to be something valuable. But like, if it's like you know, grains that humans can eat, eat, and you know, that I think has an inherent value. So I think there are non-fiat currencies that does have inherent values and that does not have inherent values. All right. Anybody? Uh, which? Uh, GE, yeah. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Tom Moss. Uh, just want to say that uh, the fiat currency there is another component, which is the uh, the fact that it is a legal tender. So the government, uh, in some uh, some countries, uh, force the, the society to use the uh, the currency, which makes uh, more comfortable for people to use as a. So Tomas is saying that fiat currency is legal tender. So first we have to discuss what is legal tender. Does anybody want to knock that one out of the ballpark? Uh, who hasn't raised their hand yet? No. All right. Well, I think that's maybe my earlier comment. Is it, 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 can, it can be used to settle debt, and uh, and specifically specifically those to the government. So you can use gold as a money. It can be a store of value. It can be a means of exchange. But you can't pay your taxes in gold, right? You have. To well, is that money. correct? So 19th century, could you pay your taxes in gold in the US and in Britain in other countries that had gold cu currency? Is it just a yes or no, but James? It's yes, but up to 1970s, the, gold, the, the currency, the paper currency is attached to the gold standard. So inherently there is an exchange of value that is pegged by the government or, back the, or the central bank. So it's almost one of the same thing at, the, at that time until more recent years. James is saying you could use gold as legal tender. Legal tender, again, is something that a society comes together and creates a law. You know, back to the Lessig Four, that's a you know, society together. It says it's not just a social normative behavior, it's, it's a law. One must accept this. In, in the US, in the UK, in many countries, it says for, for all debts, public and private. So a, 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 a debt to the government uh, uh, or a debt in a, in a store. We're going to get to later as to when is it true that somebody has to take your cash, but I'm going to hold off on that in, in, in a minute uh, and, and, and talk about it. But I think also G he said, it was somewhere between Sean and Eric, uh, uh, both physically in the class and in terms of her articulation, that fiat currency might not have anything uh, inherently behind it, and, but gold mostly doesn't have anything inherently behind it. And then some forms of currency, like uh, grain, uh, had more. So it, maybe it's a, it's a continuum. Maybe it's not you know, black and white, 100% or 0%. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how Bitcoin fits into it. And, and our next three classes are going to be really into the technology of Bitcoin. But just, just a little bit of teasing out before I go through some lecture slides. Who wants to talk about how Bitcoin might fit into this history of money 
and then I'm going to return to that question in, in about 45 minutes and ask you again. Um, but does anybody want to say from the readings? And if you remind me your name. Isabel. Isabel. With Bitcoin, it's kind of the same, where the value is given by society, except with Bitcoin, it's not backed by any kind of central bank. So people don't think that there is an inherent value, but it like but the readings pointed out that there's sort of that same history, except it doesn't have value. All right, so Isabel is saying that Bitcoin fits into the history of money because like fiat currencies, and like Jihee said about gold, it doesn't necessarily have any inherent money, uh, monetary value, but it's a societal set of norms that people are accepting it as having value. But the t key distinction that Isabel said was that it's no central. It's not backed by any kind of central bank. It's not backed by a central bank or a central authority. Uh, Alain? Yes. Um, so Bitcoin, in my opinion, is unique because I think the value of Bitcoin changes over time, not the fluctuation that we see, like 6000 or $19,000. But in terms of the powerful, the, the utility of the coin itself, and uh, so today, for example, we might be able to buy pizza or coffee or whatever with Bitcoin. So there is an inherent value in terms of medium of exchange. And it will change as society adopts it more and more. So I think it's hard to define if there is inherent value or not. So Ron is raising that Bitcoin, <coughs> if I can put some words in your mouth and tell me if I'm correct, that Bitcoin might have some distinguishing features from even fiat currency that its value is shifting over time with adoption. Is that, I mean, you didn't use that word. Um, uh, please, uh, let me know your name again. Brutish. Oh, right, like British, but with an O, you told me earlier, Brutish. Uh, so, so I think uh, another way uh, is thinking of sitting in the history of money is the, the evolution of the ledger technology, or, uh, like accounting and and the evolution of money along with it so initially like we saw in the reading the how how it happened in the prehistoric age and then the advent of the tea ledgers and then distributed ledger which is kind of the fundamental one of the fundamental blocks of bitcoin uh, which, right so, so, so that that is another way kind of uh, natural progression of how money evolved over time so brotish yeah. yeah so what brotish has raised is also bitcoin fits into the history of ledgers whether it's double entry ledgers as recognized through T accounts or other forms of ledgers that it adds to this whole long history of ledgers. Uh, I agree with that. Um, and it's a new form of keeping ledgers, Ilan. So, so Bitcoin is also similar to gold. There's an element, of the element of scarcity. Of scarcity. Yeah. So you cannot generate that many Bitcoin. Correct. You can only generate 50 Bitcoins every 10 minutes and it keeps happening every Four years. Uh, so so scarcity, that. it seems like scarcity and ledgers uh, are important components of Viva. Yes. So it does have a fixed demand, like uh, sorry, a fixed supply, like you said, in terms of scarcity. But the more we adopt it, the more it becomes divisible in terms of units. And so we can increase its use because now you can divide, you know, you can divide them up to. This is point. So divisibility is another characteristic of money, scarcity. Adoption, as Alan said, uh, ledgers. Uh, sorry, Tomas. I was mentioning decentralization because uh, this uh, implementation uh, that we, uh, so makes feasible uh, the Bitcoin that makes feasible to implement this scarcity in the decentralized environment. Right? So without any central authority to uh, uh, define or dictate the, the supply and, the, and all the aspects of the consensus. Any, we'll take one more, and then I'll, I'll start to talk about history. Why don't we go here? Can you remind me your name? Alexis. Alexis, the country of like, um, money and like other forms of currency, uh, even if it's not controlled by like a central government or central bank, like there's no fixed uh, exchange rate. It fluctuates extremely quickly with other types of currency. So, I mean, it's still very different. So uh, Alexis, if I understand Alexis's point, is that there's no fixed exchange rate uh, about Bitcoin we're talking about. Uh, but couldn't we really broaden that to all forms of currency? I mean, what, what really is the exchange rate between an ounce of gold and a bushel of corn? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, yes, but like, for example, like some states do control the exchange rate 
way of other tenants. All right, good point. So Alexis is saying yes and no because some governments try to fix uh, now back to markets. How well has that worked when governments try to fix an exchange rate? Uh, I mean, just a, a sense of the class. Did, does that work well? Uh, so it sort of might work well in temporal short periods, works less well for, you know, decades uh, on end. I'll take one more and then I'm just, I want to go through a couple uh, things. Just one comment, that one, you can fix it on hours of work. That's how uh, economists define it. Right? But I, I just want to uh, ask, what, what is a ledger? What is a ledger? Very good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to be chatting about that in a minute, but does anybody want to uh, hit that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, we, over here. Cause we're... I was going to say, it's just a numerical record of everything recorded in a fashion. A numerical record. I think that's a good thing. A ledger is basically a way to record uh, economic activity or social relationships or financial relationships. I would say it's both a way to record economic activity and it's a system of recording financial relationships. And uh, while I, I, I didn't uh, assign these readings, some, some uh, very good ac academic research suggests that the first methods of writing and symbols of writing had to do with numbers and had to do with ledgers rather than words uh, and communication. Um, because it's so fundamental to society to record various economic transactions or to record the financial relationships amongst and between uh, members of a community, whether it was a small village or when, when society burst out of villages thousands of years ago. Does that help? We'll be back to it. Um, and better that you ask that here than in your accounting fundamentals class. <laughs> I don't know. So the readings, we've, we've sort of talked about the readings. How many of you actually watched the little three-minute video? Did you? What 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 do you think? Just I mean, just as a uh, I'm s sorry uh, here we haven't chatted yet. I think the broad based principle was that any currency or anything for that matter has value equivalent to what the society assigns to it. Right. Because the, because the video basically just showed a guy who created his own currency and was just selling it to the public, and his whole claim was that it is real if you believe it is real. Right. right. So, so it was just a, it was a nice little ditty in Hawaii. Matthew, I'm sorry. I'm gonna give him a dollar for it. You would have given him a dollar. Yeah. Great. Yeah, after seeing how much the pizzas went for. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Would anybody else have given him a dollar for it? No. Maybe. Oh, oh you would have? Yeah. I, actually, I'm, I'm working with local <coughs> currencies. And it's kind of the same, but they are just, uh, you can use it just locally. And I mean, it keeps the money inside the community that decides to use that way of transaction. Right. We're going to refer back to each of these readings as we go through the next 45 minutes, but yeah. Well, I was wondering if he was actually breaking the law by launching his own competing currency for the U.S. dollar. Is that a legitimate, uh, you know, obviously it didn't compete with the U.S. dollar. But you, you know, you raise a very good question. I'm not aware of any uh, statute, uh, federal or state, uh, that says there's an absolute monopoly <laughs> on forms of currency. As there is in other things, like you know that 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 slot in the door that's called the 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 where you can put a letter through the door, or a mailbox. There's actually a law that says that the U.S. Postal Service has a monopoly, and that's why UPS is not allowed to put their boxes or anything in there. There there is a government fiat monopoly. But you raise a very good question. Um, what we've found in the last 10 years with Bitcoin, without, with, with really oversimplifying, is that it is legal to create your own form of money, as, as Bitcoin uh, is possibly this money. Uh, but you have to comply with all the other laws. And all those other laws that we'll talk about in other lectures, uh, in essence, fall into buckets of guarding against illicit activity. So the Bank Secrecy Act, and all the laws related to anti-money laundering and terrorism finance and so forth. That one still has to pay your taxes if you're uh, gaining or losing on this investment. Um, 
that uh, the Federal Reserve and other m authorities around the globe still want to ensure for financial stability. Uh, the fellow on the streets of, I don't remember what city, New York, selling his dollars when Matthew bought it for a dollar. And I think over here, uh, Bri Brian, what's that? Yes, Bruce uh, bought it. It's probably, we're going to have, the, the society is still going to be stable. It's going to be all right. Um, but if millions of people were buying it, then, then people might worry. And then there's the third big bucket that we look at as investor and consumer protection. But I think it's allowed. Um, so we'll refer to these, and Joe Quinn, and then I'm going to go on. Can you legally pay, for example, salaries in Bitcoin in the US? Yes. And why is it that you can legally pay for, for wages in Bitcoin in the US? Does anybody, I know it's outside of the readings, but why do you think it is allowed in this uh, uh, society? Uh, is it uh, Kyle? Uh, wouldn't those compensation forms be allowed under any contract? Right? Well, that's right. so most, most things, you could pay somebody in uh, these placards. I doubt, really, that you're going to value them much, but you could pay somebody in this, you could pay somebody in gold, euros. Bitcoin, and there are firms that are paying. Usually they are developing blockchain applications. Um, and interestingly, they have to compute the value of the wages to do withholding taxes, because the US government will not accept taxes in Bitcoin. So they, they figure out the fair market value. And there are companies in the US that pay people in Bitcoin. Uh, who are doing development work around blockchain applications, but the taxes need to be computed and, and, and analyzed and then paid in U.S. dollars. Because And there was a, a legislative initiative in Arizona earlier this year where a state legislature wanted to have Arizona be the first state in the land to accept Bitcoin for taxes, but it uh, failed in committee. It didn't even get a full vote of, I, I can't remember if it was the Arizona Senate or the Arizona House of uh, Delegates, but... Uh, um, so just a little walk through the history. I was going to do a little history of money and have some fun. Um, so in Ethiopia, people put together salt bars. These, this is not that long ago. Salt, as Jihi would have said earlier, is really valuable in society. And they standardized the shape and size and said, here's salt bars. Uh, we're going to get to a little bit later all the characteristics of money. But what else do you think a salt bar in Ethiopia, as opposed to maybe some other country, uh, what, what, what did it have as well as to why people might use that? Um, oil. What's that? Crude oil. Crude oil. All right, I hadn't thought of that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep thinking about that. It's not, a, it's not a common characteristic of money, but why salt bars, what else might it have in, in Ethiopia? Uh, are you gonna say that you can use salt to preserve food? Well, you can preserve food, but because it was mined, there was some scarcity as well. And, and a lot of currencies, a lot of monies over time have that fundamental issue. Cowie shells uh, from West Africa. Does anyone know the history of when cowie shells got really debased and, and stopped being used from the readings? I can't remember if that was in, in the readings or not. They got debased when Europeans started to realize <laughs> that they were accepted as a value. And it's a very sad and terrible history, too, because it's related to the whole slave trade. But that, that the Europeans could figure out that, that societies accepted this as something of value. But they also debased that currency, and they debased the land and captured people as slaves. I mean, it was a, quite a, uh, a collection of, of not particularly good things going on. Tally sticks in England. Is anybody from the readings, because there was a little bit of the debate in the first reading about the history of money, uh, want to chat, uh, and I'll pull up the rye stones from Yap. How this fits into that first reading and the debate between, has, did money come from a history of border, or did money come from a history of ledgers and credit, which is kind of the setup of that first, I think the first uh, reading. Any thoughts? 
Which ones of these, these four bits of money, early money, are more about maybe barter? Uh, so there, there are two, uh, two theories, right? Uh, debt, which corresponds to this one. Uh, this was the way to measure debt. Which, which one? The sticks. The sticks, the tally sticks, yes, correct. Which is the second one on here that has to do with debts, actually, and credits? The stones. The stone, the rye stones. So it's remarkable. The rye stones were so heavy that on this island of Yap, they couldn't possibly lug it around and use it you know, in traditional medium of exchange. But it was viewed as, well, I have one sixth of this rye stone. You have one sixteenth. And then if I make an exchange, we'd remember. And the society was small enough to keep a form of ledgers, even to the extent that when a rye stone was lost in a river, they said, you know, the river of rye stone, we each have this piece. So on the island of Yap, I, I can assure you these stones could not be used for anything else. Does anyone uh, know, because it was outside the readings, what made these stones so scarce? So rye stones were quarried on an island about 200 kilometers away from Yap. So they were exceedingly hard to get, like gold, like mining of gold. What else is mined these days that might be a money? Lithium. What's that? Can I hear everybody? I'm saying lithium. What's that? The batteries for batteries is, is going to be uh, very difficult in the future for electric batteries and whatnot. But what's mined right now that's at the center of this class? <laughs> Bitcoin, right? The Yap Stone was, in essence, quarried a couple hundred kilometers away. And what debased that currency was when sailors from England came. There's a specific sailor. I think his name was O'Keefe in the late 19th century. And he realized that these stones were valuable. <laughs> and he went to the other island, and he started quarrying and came back and forth. And within a few years, the whole economic system collapsed. We moved to metal money. At first, it wasn't really stamped. It was just heavy. It was hard to quarry. Uh, bronze in Rome. Uh, there's some China. In Sweden, uh, these were starting to be stamped by the official sector. Um, and then we had minted money, starting somewhere around 2,500 years ago. And there's debates as to whether it started in Greece or in China. Um, and, uh, but, but where an official emblem was placed upon a scarce resource that was used. Paper money came along, in a sense, for what reason? Why, why, did, why did society first tip into paper money? Because um, there's not enough gold to back it up. I mean, like, because there's right. one, one reason it's not enough gold. Oh, I'm sorry. I, haven't... I think it's just easy to ease of use. It's kind of heavy, especially if there wasn't gold, and if it was copper, or bronze, it was just heavy, or if it was wheat, you'd have to put it in a storage unit. So the first paper monies from China were basically warehouse receipts. And I spent uh, five years running something called Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and so I guess I learned a lot about warehouse receipts, commodity receipts, where you put a commodity in a warehouse. And then you got a piece of paper that said, yes, you have that commodity there. So the first paper monies were basically warehouse receipts in China. Because whatever it was, grain or gold, and then you had a piece of paper backing it. These are five pound notes from England and the continental notes in the US. But between uh, that, that note in China is about 700 years old. But before, between that first paper money and the 18th century, who do you think were kind of the first bankers uh, in the seven, uh, late 17th century, early 18th century? Who were, what, what craft had they been in before they were in banking? Trading. 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 Alpha. Yeah, international trade. International trade. They actually did something more local. I, I, I thought just thought about the pseudo, like the, the ones that had lands and uh, all the, the the ones that have lands and all the, the, the places. Lanes? Land. 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 No, they, they had something else that they were doing. Tom? Printmakers. Printmakers, I like that. We're not there yet. 
Money What's that? They're underwriting insurance. A little bit later. <laughs> they're doing agriculture? It's definitely outside of the reading. They were goldsmiths. The, some of the first dominant bankers in, in London, they, they were small goldsmiths. And they took the gold, they gave you a piece of paper, and then they went from there. And then all of a sudden, they figured out how to do credit. Later in the semester, we're going to talk about Bitcoin credit. It's not there yet, by the way. I think in the next 18 to 36 months, we're going to start seeing crypto lending and, and, and crypto finance in the form similar to what the goldsmiths were doing in the early 1700s in England. No line? Is that scalable with the finite number of uh, bitcoins, in your opinion? It's a very good question. Is it scalable to lend against a finite currency? Um, I, I, I think so, but it's not, it's not done yet, right? Um, yeah, because when you, when you lend money to someone, um, I guess it couldn't be in the form of Bitcoin, but you could lend someone dollars, they could redeem in Bitcoin, you'd be increasing kind of the money supply. Right. So you don't need, you're not moving money around, you're actually... So this is exactly the central of commercial banking today. It's called fractional banking. We'll be talking about that in a bit, but is to, yes, you could, you could, you could lend and then have a multiplier effect. Um, you also had then banks come up and started to issue private banknotes. Private banknotes are effectively a liability of that bank and saying it would trade. And the history of private banknotes is usually what? <laughs> you know, good until it's really bad. Um, and the history of money, a lot of private banks uh, went bust uh, in this country around the Revolutionary Period, again around the Civil War. Um, and in essence, that's what we have now with 1,600 different cryptocurrencies. We have a, a sort of a new period of a little bit of private currencies. Um, and uh, I, I only ask you to remember that as we start to look at ICOs, initial coin offerings, and so forth. Um, so ledgers. The earlier question is, what was a ledger? Uh, you, you asked it. Can you remember? What's a ledger? It's a way to record economic transactions. There you go. go. Principal recordings of accounts. And 5,000 years ago, you had a little reading on this, uh, just a medium post. It wasn't meant to be a deep ac economic academic paper, but it was to try to get, get the class thinking about uh, uh, ledgers. This is the personal ledger of George Washington, our first president. He was 15 years old when he kept this ledger. And he apparently kept ledgers until his, his death in, um, let's see, uh, 52 years later. Um, but so ledgers could be kept just to record the transactions of the day. Uh, he's got one up there, Mary Washington. It must have been a cousin, or I can't remember if it was his mother. Um, so if they're the principal recordings of accounts, and I've already sort of said this, they record economic activity and financial relationships. Economic activity in, in, in a sense of transactions. Financial relationships, what's a, the, the, a key financial relationship a, a ledger might record? I'm sorry? Debt. De Kelly said it, debt. And it goes back to the debate you had in the reading, is money a history of barter? Did it come out of barter? Did it come out of a, a sense of debts and credit and store of value? For this purpose today, it doesn't really matter. It may have come from both, but know that it has both sides. And ledgers have both sides, too. And when we're talking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin, you will see, is a, is a mechanism to store transactions. Some other blockchains, like Ethereum, stores balances. So even in the blockchain world, you will see some that are balanced ledgers and some which are transaction ledgers. Not to lose you and confuse you, but it's an important uh, part of, of what is blockchain. Uh, some types of ledgers. I just mentioned one, transactions versus balance. George Washington's ledger 
by the way, I think was a transaction ledger. He was just keeping you know, a list of, of, of sales and movements. But I, I haven't studied uh, President George Washington's ledger close enough. Does anybody uh, know enough accounting to tell me the difference between a general ledger and a sub-ledger, or a general ledger and a supporting ledger? I mean, I don't want to do the whole lecture myself. How many of you have taken accounting? Uh-huh. <laughs> I taught undergraduate accounting <laughs> once. Um, sorry. Um, so those of you who just put up your hand who took accounting, did, did I see in the back of the room? Did you take accounting? And that's Aviva. Actually. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Did you pass the CPA? Oh, we have a certified public accountant who's going to tell us the difference between a general ledger and a subledger. Sure, general ledger is one that, that records all kinds of transactions, any kind of um, activity that takes place, you record in the general ledger. And then subledgers, you can call them as like a specialization. So let's say if there's a salary or uh, to be paid, so there'll be a salary subledger. But it'll also go in the general ledger and then the other part of the transactions in the, in the salary ledger. Or if there's um, capital or if there's, um, or if there's um, new stuff that you buy. So all of that goes specifically in the general ledger and each of them have their own specific ledger. So if you want to say how much you spent on um, salaries for the month, then you go to your salary ledger and see. But if you want to see overall how much money you've spent and how much has moved around, then you look at your general ledger. Aviva clearly said it better than I could have. Uh, thank you. Um, now we know we have one CPA in the class. Um, but the importance, it's not just a passing note, the importance of a general ledger and subledgers is there's a hierarchy as well. Subledgers have more detail, and maybe the net number is kept on the general ledger. That is at the heart of our system of banking and is at the heart of our system of financial markets. Where the central bank is like a general ledger for money, and every commercial bank, all 9,000 of them or so in the US, in essence keep a sub-ledger for money. But they do not have control of what I will call the master ledger or general ledger at the Federal Reserve. Then a third distinction about ledgers is single entry. A little young 15-year-old George Washington was keeping a single entry ledger, just a list of things that was going on. And I didn't think I was going to bore the class with readings about double entry bookkeeping because you've taken accounting. But does anybody want to tell me, other than Aviva, what double entry bookkeeping? And she'll bail you out. Uh, uh, yeah. It, double entry bookkeeping basically means that any transaction has two places in the ledger, one on the credit side and one on the debit side, because every transaction involves one person lending, whereas the other person is, uh, is getting the thing. Okay. It works for me. Anybody else want a different view? Uh, another way of looking at it is uh, like asset and liability plus equity in two sides, and then putting basically the debit and credit entries to balance each other for every transaction. So there's a balancing between assets and liabilities, and then the resulting bit of capitalism in it is if assets are more than liabilities, the rest is capital. So at the heart of capitalism, in a sense, is double entry bookkeeping. And in fact, while it probably goes back a little over a thousand years, when it was truly written up by the Italians in the, the 1300s, it start, started to help Europe come out of the Dark Ages. I mean, the commercial renaissance of the Middle Ages, some would say, was in part, not entirely, but in part on the backs of double entry bookkeeping. So ledgers matter, is my point. They're not going to be the heart and soul of this class, but Bitcoin, which is a transaction ledger, Ethereum, which is a balance ledger, our, our financial system, which is all set up on ledgers, is a relevant sort of subtext you don't have to be afraid of it, just as you don't have to be afraid of, of hashing power that we'll be talking about on Thursday and cryptography. But you have to have some you know, sort of basic sense of where's, where's Bitcoin fit in in terms of ledgers. Does anybody, I, 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 I didn't fill this slide in. You'll find out it's blank. Does anybody want to tell me what some characteristics of a good ledger? Because again, as you start to think about your blockchain projects later in the semester, it's like, what makes a good ledger? I don't have any answers here. Yes, they, they, 
the Bitcoin world, immutable. So you want it to be immutable, maybe. Um, Talita, can you do me a favor and keep these? We'll put them on the slides. When we put, we'll keep the classes list and we'll put them in the slides. Immutable, I like that. Uh, anybody else want to grab something which is a good ledger? Uh, What's that? Time stamped. All right, so that you know when you made your entry. Uh, Kelly? Ownership. Ownership. What do you mean by ownership? The, the, essentially the receiver and the person giving. So essentially who's taking what, who's giving what. So if there's a transaction, the two counterparties to the transaction, right? And if it's a balance, then who owns the balance? I was just adding a little bit to, uh, let's see if we have a new name or face. Back here on, on the back table, I haven't chatted with you yet. What is that? Ross. Ross, thank you, Ross, good to meet you. Pleasure to meet you as well. Uh, accuracy? <laughs> accuracy, so uh, Ross says accuracy, and can we take one or two more? Just a, so a description of the transaction. So Andrew says a description of the transaction, and last? Mr. Ross. Awesome. Yeah, uh, comprehensive. What's that? Comprehensive. Comprehensive. So all good attributes of, a, of a characteristics. Somebody's burning desire that we missed one or two. Gee, he, all right. I just was curious, um, consistency maybe, but I don't know if that's consistency. Well, I think that's inside of immutability. That in essence, that it's valid, that you can't, tr you can't change it, uh, you can't counterfeit it, and, and the like. And what you'll find is, is the characteristics of a good ledger is also in some part similar to the characteristics of good money. They're not identical, but they overlap a lot. Payment systems, I'm just going to say one line about it. It's a method, basically, to amend and record changes in a ledger for money. I know it's not what you usually think about a payment system, but if you go into Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee and use your cell phone, aren't you really just amending a set of ledgers? Starbucks's ledger goes up, and yup, your ledger goes down. Well, your monetary ledger goes up. Your utility, your fulfillment from that latte might go up. I'm talking about the financial ledger. So I, I just wanted to ground, when we talk about payment systems, to think about it's really just a way to amend usually two parties' ledgers, one going up, one going down. Now, in an earlier time, it was handing somebody a bit of gold or a bit of silver, and it was not recorded on central ledgers, but we already live in an age of electronics, so this is really what a payment system largely is. It's not entirely. There's still some other ways to do finance. So. What were some early forms of payment systems that did just that, that moved and changed ledgers? They're called negotiable orders. I would dare say that most of you probably have not used negotiable orders of withdrawal that much in the last week or the last month. Has anybody here written a, a personal check in the last week? But in an earlier era, it would have been the whole class. <laughs> Anybody in the class not even have a checkbook? Three quarters of the class. Larry, how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> but a checkbook is, in essence, a, a, with a, what, what do you put on a check? What's a, these are, this is all about Bitcoin now. I'm not doing this just as a, as a, a walk down memory lane for Larry and myself. Uh, what, what's the, what are the important pieces of a negotiable order withdraw or a check? We'll put your signature on it. So there's a signature. What else is there? Uh, I, I want to just people I haven't talked to in the back. Uh, I can't remember your name. I'm yeah. Dana. Dana. Um, you put out who you're paying to, how much, and what it's for. All right. So there's a bunch. So a signature, a payee, how much, and what it was for. What else? There's an account number and a routing number. Account, account numbers and routing numbers. So think about it. Account numbers and routing numbers is to, 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 to say, in essence, what ledger is this coming from? And the payee is the ledger it's to whom it's going. And I'm sorry, Dan? Uh, also a date and a date. 
So there's a timestamp, a signature, a payee, the payor in the form of the account number, and an amount. Those five are really critical, and you'll find them all are going to be right in the middle of all this Bitcoin. Uh, and then the reason why you're, you know, some in other information. I'm sorry, was there something else? Uh, okay. I just have a question. Would you consider something like PayPal or Venmo like a negotiable order? They may be. They may be new forms. They're certainly parts of the payment system. Why they might not be negotiable orders or withdrawal, they might not be a direct um, authorization for a bank with one ledger to move money to another ledger. They might be moving it on their own ledger. That, that's, it, it's, but you're, you're asking the right question. So some early money that we already talked about that was ledger were the tally sticks in England and the yap stone. These were ledger types and forms of money. And it was kind of interesting. So ledgers didn't just come with electricity and computers. So now let's get back to fiat currency, the heart of the earlier question. Um, and and uh, we already talked about it, so let's see how the professor did, because you already said some of the things that you said were fiat currency. One, social and economic consensus. Uh, um, I don't, I'm in the school that it's just part of the history. It's not that different than everything that came, even though it built on that promissory note from China 700 years ago and the private bank notes it got, and the goldsmiths in the 1700s. But ultimately, governments took control. It represents central bank liabilities, and that's important. It's a liability of a central bank. It's not an asset. It's their liability side. Um, but it's also, guess what? There's a second form of money, and that's when you, make a, you have a deposit in a bank, that's a liability of a commercial bank. Central bank is the top gold standard in a sense, using the word gold, but it's the top ledger. Commercial banks are like sub-ledgers in a sense. Please, Elaine. Sure, I'm not an economist or anything. What does it mean to be for a coin or a note to be a liability of the central bank? What does that actually mean? So uh, before I answer, does anybody want to try to answer what it is? is a Eric? Liability is basically an obligation to, in this case, to pay some, someone an amount. So because it's a social consensus, it, it's, a, it's a very good question that Alina asks is, what does it mean to be a liability of a central bank when it's just uh, uh, the currency in our pocket, right? This Federal Reserve note, this says Federal Reserve note on it. and. Um, Right, I, you know, we can pass it around. I'm, I'm not afraid. It's only a dollar, but you know, right? <laughs> Do you want me to pass around twenties and then I want them back? You know, but it says Federal Reserve note, right? Um, so it's a liability of the commercial bank. Uh, in an earlier day, it was said you could exchange it for gold or silver. Right. So that's what I understand. So you but by the 1930s, for retail deposits in the middle of the Depression, President Roosevelt said, no more, you cannot, you cannot redeem gold and silver. And then President Nixon in the 1970s said in the official sector that he was going off of the, uh, until that point in time, uh, other governments could redeem in gold. Um, but when paper money started, it was not backed by gold. We had a period of the gold standard. We were on and off of it. We fell off of it after World War, during World War I. We went back on it. It, it, it's, it, it would be a false narrative to say that we were on the gold standard for our first 140 years. Um, I just wanted to clear that up. I mean, we sort of went on the gold standard, we went off, we went back on, and so forth. But it is a liability on the books and records. So as a matter of accounting and double entry bookkeeping, I will show you in a minute the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, and I, I'll come back to this question. Is that all right? Can you clarify what is the bank liable for? So before it gave me a dollar and I could go to the dollar and get back the gold, right? right? Now, what is it liable for now? It is in essence a social, it's the first point. The, 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 I'm separating. The central bank 
is liable that they will move on its ledgers if you want to move that to somewhere else. So you could take that physical $1 in and say, I want to deposit this in a bank, and they have to record it on the ledger of that bank. That is what they are, that, that is, and the US government, which is technically separate from the central bank, or the, or the UK government, or the Chinese government, they're all technically separate from their banks, People's Bank of China or the Bank of England, their governments are saying they will accept it for payments uh, against taxes. So there's a so set of social constructs. Um, it relies on a, I'm going to just go through this to answer your question. It relies on a system of ledgers. And it's the integration of those ledgers between the banking system and the commercial banks. In the US, we have about 9,000 commercial banks. And what the Federal Reserve is saying, but it's true about the People's Bank of China, it's true about uh, the European Central Bank. Each of these central banks are basically saying, if you bring your paper money in, we'll record it on the ledger of, of a commercial bank. And you can pay your taxes to our sister over here called the government. That's, I'm sorry to let you down. It's, it's not more than that. Sorry, Elon. I have a, a potential answer. I might be totally wrong. Please, no. I think it's a legal and sustainable way to conduct, to conduct a Ponzi scheme <laughs> <laughs> with, yeah, with, with a proper Ponzi scheme where, where the value will increase by 1% to 3% if, you, if, the, if the central bank reaches the goal of inflation. All right. Any other points of view on that? Uh, I saw... I saw uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure your name. Oh, no, you don't, you don't want to say anything? No, all right. I think I'll go back to point one, right? So it's a, it's a construct that someone would give you something. So your dollar with the central bank, the central bank owes you that dollar's worth of whatever you desire, and someone will happily take that dollar from the central bank and give you the goods that you want. So it's a, it's a roundabout way of, it's a, a way of transacting something, whatever the dollar has. So it's also it's also central bank liability because like whenever the government has sovereign debt, it can't just it can't just issue new notes. It's liable, so that's why it's a liability because you can only issue notes against a certain amount of reserves that you keep. So that's why it, that's why you refer to it as a liability because you can't just issue new notes whenever you need them. Like you can't just make new money out of thin air. So you're liable for every new note. I'm going to take one more comment on this and then give a couple more things, Eric. Uh, the currency is actually a small part of the, the total reserves of the Federal Reserve System. I think maybe um, the bank reserves are maybe a more applicable application because a bank can actually require the Fed to print money by making more loans. Uh, so that in that way, there is like this mechanism to ensure that liability. So I'm very pleased with this discussion, even even Alon's uh, contribution <laughs> about the, the schemes. This this is the this is the debate. If Jay Powell were here, how many of you know who Jay Powell is? Who's Jay Powell? It's uh, uh, a lot. Jay Powell. You no, know. who's Jay Powell? Head of the Federal Reserve. Head of the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but if Jay Powell were here. Uh, he'd, he'd have a laugh along with what Alon just said, uh, but he would say also the liability is a social liability as well, that a central banker to their core believes that what they are trying to do is ensure for the stability of this social thing we call money and to make sure that it doesn't get debased and it has some value. And um, so... It's accepted for taxes. We talked about notes and coins are legal tender for all debts, public and private. I walk into a Starbucks and I say, I'd like a cup of coffee. Here's my $5 or whatever it costs these days. Does the person behind the counter have to brew the coffee? Is it just a yes or no? Can I see? Who, 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 who wants to go for it? There's a no from Christopher. What? Chris? All right. There's a no from Chris. Who agrees with Chris? Okay. They brew the cup of coffee. I go to the other side of the counter. The coffee's sitting there. Now, do they have to accept my $5 at that point? 
Yes. Before they brew the coffee, nobody has to take dollars. But once a debt is established, they've, prov they've produced the good, they've provided the service, they have to take it. Just a small little thing. That's what legal tender is. And so there's many establishments around the globe that are basically now putting little signs out, we don't take Swedish krona, we don't take this, we don't take that uh, uh, in paper form. They'll still take it electronically. And there's sort of, there's a new little bit of definitional thing going on about legal tender. There's also some unique tax treatments, but I'm not going to go through uh, the currency. So central banking and money, we talked about a little bit. This is a kind of chart that I, I borrowed from, from uh, uh, somebody else's paper. But the central bank's at the top, it's at the center. And if Alice and Bob, and we'll be talking about Alice and Bob in Bitcoin time, so you can pull this chart down later, want to transact, and they're at the same commercial bank, bank number one, then commercial bank number one has to change their ledgers, moving money from Alice to Bob. In essence, if you're both two people at Bank of America, you can move the your balance at Bank of America. But if you're at Bank of America going over to Citicorp, then something has to go between two ledgers, Bank of America's ledger and Citicorp's ledger. And the only way to transact between two banks' ledgers is some balancing act has to happen at the top ledger called the central bank. And later when we talk about payment systems, and I'm going to use this slide again later in the semester. That's why I'm not going to spend as much time now on it. We're going to talk about ledgers, and when you move money between two banks, it's all within one closed system. That country's or that uh, um, society's central banking system. But then it gets really a little bit more iffy and woolly when you're moving from one currency to another currency. Um, because how do you make two closed ledger systems operable? Not for today, but we'll, we'll go through that uh, later when we do payment systems and the, and the like. Um, the central bank, the US central bank, this was the only good slide I could find, which was about a year old. Its liabilities and assets are about four and a quarter trillion dollars, 4.3 trillion. 1.7 trillion of that is in currency. Um, do I get my one dollars back, by the way? I mean, my liabilities, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, $1.7 trillion of those greenbacks are in circulation. And remarkably, even though half of you probably don't use cash that much, you don't even have checking accounts, the amount of cash in circulation is growing faster than the economy in most developed nations. Why do you think that is? What one, probably one word. After month of uh, 2008 crisis, until the TV. Oh, that's more than one word. <laughs> drugs. Trust. Oh, trust. <laughs> I thought you said drugs. <laughs> trust. Well, it, it does have to do with trust, but it also has to do with drugs. Paper currency is a wonderful method of, of money laundering, drug running, and a store of value. So there's certain segments of our economy and segments of the worldwide economy that does not want to be in the electronic banking system. Um, I'm going to slip through these quickly, but there's another piece that we need for this whole uh, class and for the semester is credit and credit intermediation. But just a little thing, credit cards started only 60 or 70 years ago, but they go back to a book a little over 100 years ago. The word credit cards used 18 times in this book where uh, a um, a science fiction writer in 1887 said, what would the world be like in the year 2000? And it was the first use of the word credit card. And he said, there would be, society would have a form of money and you would have credit against it. And it's a fascinating thing that somebody could be that visionary. But there were merchant cards starting, so maybe he wasn't so visionary. Um, oil companies in the 1920s, uh, charge cards were starting, but they were single merchant cards. You could have credit from that merchant. In 1946, in a bank in Brooklyn, a guy named Biggins 
started with that. That was the first real charge it. You could charge things in a, a, a few dozen places in Brooklyn, literally. Um, and then all of a sudden it took off. Diners Club started in the early 1950s. They found that they could get a bunch of restaurants to say, wouldn't you want to extend credit and we'll back it. Uh, American Express in the mid-1950s. And then finally, in the mid-1960s, Bank America, which at that time was a California bank, figured out they would create a cooperative with a bunch of other US banks to extend credit. And, and, and the credit boom took off. And what was interesting, the laws to regulate all this didn't come until the 1970s, at least in the US. The Fair Credit Reporting Act and all, all the other laws. There's three big ones in the 1970s. So those who, I, I go to conferences sometimes and talk about Bitcoin regulation, and they say, well, why can't the government solve this now? I sort of remind them that it took 15 to 20 years from the introduction of credit cards kind of in the early to mid-1950s and the real takeoff in the 1960s. It was 1974, 1970, 77, the three big credit laws. So if you're going to be an entrepreneur in Bitcoin, know that it could be 15 years until there's some crypto laws um, uh, in the future. That was the processing machine from the 1950s. I, know I made it too small, sorry. Um, Visa made it better. And then, of course, that's what we all see today, how your cards get processed. Um, so the role of money we've talked about. So I'm going to skip over that. But now the characteristics of money. What makes a good money? We talked about some of this earlier. It's durable, meaning that you, that, that salt cube wasn't the greatest, because if a lot of rain came, that would kind of wash away. Gold and silver metals are durable. They're portable. The heavier it is, the less portable it is. And that's why gold was a better money than silver. You could move it around, and better than copper or bronze. Um, it was divisible. Easily, you could slice things up. Uniform and fungible. And anyone who's down the rabbit hole on this stuff, if you really want to learn about money, read about Crawford versus Royal Bank in 1749. There was a gentleman at the early part of paper money that mailed two 20-pound notes, and he wrote his name on them. They got lost in the mail, and he took the banks to court to say those were mine when they were found. And there was no law in Scotland or in England at the time as to what to do about it. But if you lose or somebody stole a piece of art, you get it back. And the law was settled in 1749 that you actually don't get your money back. Does anybody want to guess as to why the courts? It, it was a matter of first interpretation. The courts had no, they had no jurisprudence on this before 1749. Why did the courts decide that a piece of art was different than currency? And it goes to the, the fundamental of what money is, fiat money is. Anybody want to take a guess as to why the courts? They could have gone the other way. How could you tell if someone really mailed money? How could you tell he signed it. It, it, was, it was actually the facts were clear. It was the currency he signed. I'm just helping you out so that that's a good point, but he signed it. It can't be used as a medium of exchange if, you, yeah. if it doesn't belong to the person whom you wanted to get. In essence, if you were to go back and read, the, there's some history on this, and read the court cases, um, uh, this was the point. The court basically said, we have to make this a medium of exchange. This is this uh, greater social good. It has to be fungible. And the Royal Bank of Scotland was, of course, kind of you know, closer to the courts than this gentleman, <laughs> Crawford. But the banks were also saying, we, we can't keep track of this. So it was a mixture of the two. But it made it fungible. Eric? Uh, was it that specific, those specific notes that he had signed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they, yeah. They had to give and in 1749, they all had serial numbers, and they were signed in a way that not today. Of course, they're acceptable, and they're stable. And we're going to talk a lot about the last point. They're stable because they're hard to mine, and Bitcoin has that embedded in it as well. The design of money is really important as well. You can make it a token. A token is like something physical. 
or account-based. We're, of course, now live in a world of account-based money. And, and it's digital, not physical. It can be issued by the private sector just like banknotes in the 18th century, or private sector like Bitcoin, or it can be central. It can be widely acceptable or just wholesale. There are forms of wholesale money. One of the biggest forms of wholesale money is the central bank's reserves are only available to the commercial banking system. We're going to study this money flower later, but I put it in the slides because this, I didn't create this flower. You have a reading later in the semester from the Bank of International Settlement that has this money flower in it. But it's basically across these four things. Is it token or account-based, physical or digital, private or central, or widely accessible? And then all monies fall into one piece of this money flower. There's a Professor Garrett that came up with this flower, and, and there's an optional reading later in the semester from him. Um, you had a reading from Clark. There's not enough time, but all this stuff failed. Does anybody want to give me a flavor for one or two reasons why a bunch of digital cash failed? Did anybody read the Clark reading, the history of some digital cash? Oh, no line for it. Anybody else read it? Over here, I can't remember. Zahn. Zahn. So what, what did you? Zahn. What? Zahn. 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 What did you take from the reading? Why did these all fail? What's like the one or two biggest reasons they failed? One of them, most of them still relied on kind of some form of a central authority. All right. they, they relied on a central, DigiCast certainly did, yep. David Shams piece and some of the others. Any other big reason, Lean, did you have? Uh, there wasn't enough adoption by merchants, I recall. There's definitely not adoption by merchants, very good. Third reason why they failed, one that's at the core of what Bitcoin solved. Uh, Incentivizing like a decentralized network to keep that ledger, maintain the ledger. All right, incentivizing the ledger behind it. Uh, they couldn't solve the double spend problem. That's it. Couldn't spend the double spend problem. Could a currency be spent not just once, but twice? So there's four things that were raised, four things that was about centralization, the double spend, uh, they couldn't get merchants to adopt it, and there was uh, couldn't some form of consensus as to what the ledger was. I'm going to flip through these quickly, but digital and mobile money did happen. We were asked about PayPal earlier. It was 1998. In, in uh, Norway, Ericsson and Telenor had the first mobile app, and it was to get movies on your mobile phone. Um, 1999, Alipay comes along that we'll talk a lot about when we do payments later, and of course, uh, M-Pesa that we talked about a little last week in Kenya where it was Safaricom noticed that a bunch of money, near money, it was mobile minutes that was being used as money in Kenya, and now there's 20 million users of that. And of course, there's a bunch of regulations now and so forth. Um, Starbucks started in 2011. And then, of course, it's now off to the races in mobile money. One of the key things about mobile money we will discuss and learn together is the question, each one of these is, where is the stored value? And I have to tell you, sometimes I get quite confused when I research a new app. Are they storing the value, or are they just a processing provider to move, as we said earlier, payment systems move and change and amend other ledgers? In a number of these, like M-Pesa, initially they were storing the value. And mobile app Starbucks stores the value. But many of them are just applications, computer code, to move the ledger somewhere else. But the riddle remained. You remember that riddle, how to move money peer to peer without a central authority. And that's what I'm asking for next class, Thursday, to actually read. I wouldn't wing it. And I wouldn't be afraid of it. Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a paper that everybody in this class, if you're at MIT and a few of you are at Harvard, I'm telling you, you can read it. You'll understand maybe a half to two thirds of it. It's not deeply technical. It, it's, 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 and it's only eight or nine pages. I've also assigned uh, National Institute of Science and Technology about 20 pages of reading from NIST. Um, the question is whether that's Bitcoin. 
I'm going to skip through the study questions, but the study questions are really about cryptography and how append only timestamping. We are going to get into the nitty gritty over three lectures. I couldn't commit the whole the course, the whole semester, but I think three lectures Thursday and the two next week. Anytime you want to come to see me, Sabrina is somewhere here on the floor, who's one of our TAs, who's a computer science uh, um, master's student and, and knows more about all of this. Medores, who was here last week, I don't know if Medores is here, who's part of the Digital Currency Initiative. Over three lectures, we're going to try to work through what's the cryptography and why does that matter? How does the time stamping happen? How does this look like money and how are the transactions kept? Yes, you get to close it out almost. Can you tell us the answer to the question you posed about the longest running blockchain? I can answer that, but the assignment was to answer it by Thursday, right? Oh, Thursday, okay. So th by Thursday, what's your first name? Caroline. Caroline. Did I say I was going to answer it today? Oh, did I say today? No, is there a mutable record of what I said? <laughs> I'll answer it now if you want, but who, does anyone have the answer in the whole class? Yeah, it's a service called Shirky that uh, was it began, began working in 1995. It was a timestamp uh, service for digital documents. And the way they did it was use a hash, hash function to create a seal uh, with a timestamp of the document and then process the weekly batch of seals and uh, they actually published it in the New York Times in a small So, Caroline, uh, it's good to raise the question. I thought it was for Thursday, but thank you. Stuart Haber, a cryptographer and a colleague at Bell Labs in the early 90s, said, how do we notarize information, digitally notarize? And we're going to be talking about this Thursday a lot. They used a cryptographic method called hash functions. And uh, they were just trying to notarize information. And by 1995, they, took, they, they were entrepreneurs. They created a company called Surety. And once a week, they publish in the New York Times. And they still do it. You can get a New York Times. I believe it's on Saturday or Sunday. And they take, it's in the classified section. And they have the hash function, which you'll read about between now and Thursday. They have the hash of all the pre-existing information. And so they timestamp it by using the New York Times, and they use cryptography, and it's currently 23 years and running. Correct, because block, uh, Bitcoin is about 550,000 blocks, and this would be whatever 23 years times 52 is. Longest in time. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you.